This is a homily for the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 27. We are in the region of Caesarea Philippi, about 40 kilometres to the north of the Lake of Galilee. In last Sunday's Gospel, Jesus put a question to his disciples. Who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus then said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I now say to you, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the underworld will never overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. As we saw last Sunday, the key was the symbol of office for the royal steward, the officer second only to the king in Israel. In Isaiah chapter 22, the key is entrusted to Eliakim, after Shebna, an arrogant and self-seeking official, is dismissed from office. So the keys entrusted to Peter are symbols of the authority that Jesus has entrusted to him. Jesus then warns his disciples that he is going up to Jerusalem, and there he must suffer many things, be killed and rise again. In fact, we have three prophecies of the Passion in Matthew's Gospel, the first of which we have heard in today's Gospel. The second prophecy of the Passion occurs in the following chapter, and the third prophecy of the Passion follows in chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. In chapter 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem on the day that we now know as Palm or Passion Sunday. The following chapters give an account of the last week in the life of Jesus, culminating with his crucifixion on the Friday and his resurrection on the Sunday. How do the disciples react to these prophecies? In today's Gospel, Peter says, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Peter has just acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, God's anointed one. The idea of a suffering and dying Messiah is beyond Peter's comprehension. As I pointed out last week, in the thousand years between the reign of King David and the time of Jesus, the Jewish people had been conquered by one superpower after another. At the time of Jesus, the Jews were subjects of the Roman Empire. It was understandable that people looked back to the time of David and saw it as a golden age when they were free of foreign oppression. The so-called Psalms of Solomon, written in the first century BC, reflect the hopes of many in Israel at that time, They prayed that God would send them another ruler like King David who would set them free. Raise up for them their king, the son of David, to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles. He will have Gentile nations serving under his yoke. He will be a righteous king, the Lord Messiah. It would seem that sentiments like these were in the minds of Peter and the disciples when they acclaimed Jesus as the Messiah. The job description of Messiah was clear. Kick out the Romans, restore the fortunes of Israel, defeat our enemies, bring freedom, prosperity and peace to Israel, make us once again rulers of our own destiny. New Testament scholar Tom Wright explains what is happening here. At the heart of the story is the head-on clash between what Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples and what they assume their journey to Jerusalem is all about. 
they are so convinced that he must really be following the sort of plan they have in mind that they simply can't register his repeated warnings that it's all going to be very different. He is talking about dying a horrible death. And they seem to think it's just picture language for the great victory he's going to win. So, in a sense, it is, but not at all in the way they think. In the first chapter of the letter to the Romans, Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel. In her book, The Crucifixion, Fleming Rutledge poses the question, why should he be ashamed, we might ask? Why would it be necessary to issue this disclaimer? A person opening the Bible in search of spiritual guidance, inspiration or instruction might well be puzzled to find so blunt a reference to being ashamed. One might search religious literature for a long time and never find any such language as this. In his letter to the Romans, Paul seems to assume that his hearers will know what he means when he says he is not ashamed. About the Corinthians, however, he can't be so certain, so he goes into more detail. It is the crucifixion as a means of execution, he says, that would normally cause shame for anyone associated with the victim. So in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul spells it out. We are proclaiming a crucified Christ, to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Gentiles foolishness. For the disciples of Jesus at Caesarea Philippi, a crucified Messiah seemed like a contradiction in terms. It would be like your star player coming onto the football field on crutches and his leg in plaster. He's not going to kick any goals like that. Jesus responds to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because you are thinking not as God thinks but as humans do. Harsh words indeed. Jesus calls Peter Satan in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word Satan, Hebrew is written from right to left, means adversary or opponent. In the Old Testament, it is a word used of both human and heavenly figures who act as accusers or adversaries, either as agents or enemies of God. In Job and Zechariah, the definite article is added to the noun, ha-satan, the Satan, indicating that the term in these contexts does not denote a proper name. Ha-satan refers to a celestial being who has been assigned the temporary role of adversary or accuser in order to keep a watchful eye on humanity or to accuse and test God's people. Job chapters 1 and 2 portray Ha-Satan as standing among the sons of God in the divine assembly. There, the Satan is clearly subordinate to God and unable to act without God's permission. In the New Testament, the word Satan is used 35 times as a proper name for God's enemy. Satan is generally characterized as the ruler of a kingdom of darkness and the adversary of God. Jesus then calls Peter a stumbling block, a translation of the Greek skandalon. That's where our English word scandal comes from. So Peter has gone from being the rock to being a stumbling block. New Testament scholar Brendan Byrne offers this commentary on what is happening here. This stands in starkest contrast to the beatitude so recently pronounced. The sharpness suggests that Jesus experiences in Peter's remonstrance something of the earlier suggestion made by the devil at the temptation in chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. 
that he be the Messiah of conventional expectation, far removed from the fate just outlined. Peter has now become a rock of stumbling rather than of insight, tripping up Jesus' fulfilment of the role marked out for him by God. The exchange shows how incomplete Peter's grasp of Jesus' mission remains, despite his being the privileged recipient of revelation. He and the remaining disciples have a long and painful journey to travel before they can hold together two seemingly incompatible truths, that Jesus is unique Son of God and that he must enter into the pain and suffering of this world to heal it from within. Jesus then goes on to say, Anyone who wants to be a follower of mine must renounce self and take up the cross and follow me. The cross today has become a fashion accessory, as you can see here. I recall hearing of a woman who went to a jewellery store to buy a silver cross. The sales assistant showed her one, but then said, If you don't like the plain cross, we do have one with a little man on it. As Tom Wright explains, the symbol of the cross meant something quite different in the time of Jesus. The very mention of crucifixion was taboo in polite Roman circles, since it was the lowest form of capital punishment reserved for slaves and rebels. As for the Jews, the very idea of a crucified Messiah was scandalous. A crucified Messiah was a horrible parody of the kingdom dreams that many were cherishing. It immediately implied that Israel's national hope was being radically redrawn downward. Fleming Rutledge explains, Crucifixion was specifically designed to be the ultimate insult to personal dignity, the last word in humiliating and dehumanizing treatment, Degradation was the whole point. Joel Green writes this, Executed publicly, situated at a major crossroads on a well-trafficked artery, devoid of clothing, left to be eaten by birds and beasts, victims of crucifixion were subject to optimal, unmitigated, vicious ridicule. Cicero Roman statesman, philosopher and writer described crucifixion as the most cruel and disgusting penalty. He wrote that it was the most extreme form of torture inflicted upon slaves. The Jewish historian Josephus called crucifixion the most pitiable of deaths. And Origen, the third century theologian, wrote the most shameful form of death, namely the cross. After the Gladiator War, which lasted from 73 to 71 BC, the Romans crucified 6,000 slaves all along the 200 kilometres of the Via Appia between Rome and Capua. That means that over a distance of 200 kilometres, there was one cross roughly every 33 metres. Here you can see the Via Appia, or the Appian Way, as it is today. Catholics in the 21st century would expect to see a crucifix displayed prominently in every church. But because the cross was such an abhorrent symbol in the ancient Roman world, it would seem that even Christians shied away from images of Jesus on the cross. The first known representation of Christ crucified is found in Rome in the church of Santa Sabina, built between 422 and 432 AD. The image of Christ crucified appears on the main door of the church. These cypress wood doors, still in place today, were carved between 430 and 432 AD. Timothy Radcliffe, former Master General of the Dominicans, explains that it took the church 400 years to dare to portray Christ on the cross, on the door of Santa Sabina. 
Here you can see the crucified Christ between two thieves carved in wood. But even this representation of the crucifixion doesn't actually show the cross. Even in our own day, some people find the image of a suffering deity difficult to accept. Timothy Radcliffe writes of a statue of Ecce Homo, the naked Christ, that was placed on a plinth in Trafalgar Square, London, in 1999. It was of a slim young man who looked incredibly vulnerable. Unlike all the statues of the great and good around him, and even the lions, he was just our size. A passerby is reported to have said, If that's Jesus Christ, it's a bloody miracle. You couldn't put your faith in someone like that. He's as weak as a kitten. The Australian cartoonist Michael Lunig makes a similar point. His cartoon character has found God. God spoke to him. God said, help me, I'm wounded. God lay bleeding on the ground. You're not God, said the man. God is all powerful. I'm all vulnerable, said God. I am in pain. I am at your mercy. These words were so unbearable to the man, so infuriating, that he finished God off right there and then. Looney's cartoon identifies an important point. The religious imagination seeks uplift, not torture, humiliation and death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that the weakness and suffering of Christ was and remains a reversal of what the religious person expects from God. So it's easy to see why the thought of a crucified Messiah was unbearable, even infuriating, to Jews in Jesus' own day. Jesus continues, Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word translated here as life is suke in the Greek. This word is used in the New Testament to mean life or true self. And losing one's life means the displacement of the ego from the centre of its universe and the accompanying willingness to give up personal ambition and even to suffer and, if need be, die for God's cause. Thomas Merton makes this observation. Every one of us is shadowed by an illusory person, a false self. All sin starts from the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my own egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life to which everything else in the universe is ordered. The Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar writes about the two different dramas we can live out in life. One he calls the theodrama. The word theo comes from the Greek word theos, which means God. So the theodrama places God at the centre of existence. The other drama he calls the ego drama. The ego drama places me at the centre of existence. It's all about me. The false self that Thomas Merton writes about wants to star in the ego drama. I want to write the script for my ego drama. I'm the director. I'm also producing it. And above all, I play the starring role. Everyone else in this world is so very lucky to be able to play a supporting role in the drama of my life. It's all about me. While pushing Lucy on the swing, Linus is reading aloud to his sister. It says here that the world revolves around the sun once a year. Lucy questions that. The world revolves around the sun? Are you sure? 
I thought it revolved around me. Some years ago, the American writer David Brooks wrote a book entitled The Road to Character. The central thesis of the book is this. We have moved from a culture that encouraged people to think humbly of themselves to a culture that encourages people to see themselves as the centre of the universe. Brooks tells us that psychologists have a thing called the narcissism test. They read people's statements and ask if the statements apply to them. Statements such as, I'd like to be the centre of attention. I show off if I get the chance because I am extraordinary. Somebody should write a biography about me. Over the last 20 years, the median narcissism score has risen by 30%. The largest gains are the two statements, I am an extraordinary person, and I like to look at my body. In the words of St. Augustine, this describes a life that is curvatus in se, turned in upon itself, self-obsessed. New Testament scholar John Mayer explains what Jesus is asking of his disciples. Discipleship means an affirmation of Jesus which entails a negation of self-centeredness, an immolation of egotism on the cross. As goes the Master, so goes the disciple. A truly fulfilled life eludes the grasp of the person who selfishly seeks self-fulfillment. Only those who cease to grasp at life, only those who give up their little projects of a tailored-to-order existence and who surrender their lives to God in imitation of and for the sake of the crucified Jesus will receive the fullness of life as a gift from God. Lewis Carroll had such a great success with Alice in Wonderland that he wrote a follow-up. The follow-up was called Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there. And what did Alice find there? Well, things were the opposite to what you expect. And so when we look into a mirror, what is in reality our right hand appears to be our left hand in the mirror. Our image is laterally inverted. And so the kingdom, the rule or reign of God, is contrary to the strategies employed by the powers of this world. As Jesus puts it in today's gospel, anyone who wants to save his life will lose it but anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. Today's gospel offers us a looking-glass view of life. It is not the powerful and wealthy who can offer us ultimate meaning and fulfilment, but an executed criminal. The theodrama is about taking up the cross and following Jesus, but thereby finding the path to wholeness and life in its fullness. Anyone who wants to save his life will lose it, but anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. In the upside-down world of God's kingdom, it's about a cross, not a crown. It's about being last, not first. Being servant and slave, not lord. About service, not prestige about self-sacrifice, not glory.